So I'm going to spend about, I don't know, not, 20 minutes maybe, um, speaking to you about 1325. Um, and then after that, we will have a question and answer and discussion session. Um, so uh, I will use these slides, unfortunately, so they're in English. Um, but then I will also speak in addition to the slides, okay? So um, I will not just read off the slides. I will also explain as I go along. So, um, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 is the first Security Council Resolution on World Peace and Security. Now, it was the resolution that was passed in 2000, and it was a very important resolution because it's very much civil society, it's very much women's organizations themselves who pushed for this resolution. Because there was a clear feeling amongst the women's movement that there was no clear UN acknowledgement of the role of women in peace and security. So that's why that resolution was passed in 2000. And what we say and what I will describe is that the resolution has four main pillars, which are prevention, participation, protection, and relief and recovery. So I will now explain each of those um, different concepts. Okay. Um, so what we look at, um, the, as I said, the four pillars. Um, the first pillar is the issue of prevention. So this is to prevent violations of women's rights, violations of human rights, um, other incidents that we see against uh, women. But so first, it's also a prevention of, of restart of conflict, and really all forms of structural and physical violence against women and girls including sexual and gender-based violence. So there's a big focus on sexual and gender-based violence. Um, now, what we see is that it's not only about, so just saying that it's prevention, but it's also about the role that we can all play in prevention. So basically, it's about the role that women can, can play in preventing conflict. So how can they do that? They can prevent conflict by monitoring the situation by working with local communities at the local level, by what we call providing early warning. So again, monitoring and warning if there's a, a violent situation. Um, liaising and mediating between conflict sides. So this is what women's organizations can do in terms of prevention. And I'm sure that there's also many other uh, roles that women's organizations can play and that some of you are already playing um, on the issue of prevention. Um, but uh, this is an example. And this is very much one of the kind of the, the top pillar of the Women, Peace, and Security uh, agenda is to work on prevention. Another pillar is the issue of protection. So protecting and promoting the human rights of women and girls and ensuring their physical safety, health, and economic security. So, um, of course, it's very linked uh, to the issue of prevention. But here, we're, we're focusing um, on really protection from rights violations. Um, and so here, one of the, of course, main problems in conflict is uh, the issue of sexual and gender-based violence, and particularly of rape. So what we see is that too often rape is used as a weapon of war, and women are victims of conflict-related sexual violence. Um, it can take many years for women survivors to get the legal, medical, psychological, and economic support that they deserve. So what we see is that really rape was only recognized as a tool of warfare uh, during the conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina, or rather after the conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina, that's when it became recognized. And what we clearly see is that sexual and gender-based violence are regularly used as a tool of warfare. Now I should say that we, you know, we saw it in the conflicts in former Yugoslavia, but we also see it very much today. Um, we see it, for example, of course, with the, the, the Yazidi women in Iraq. Um, we see it with Boko Haram in Nigeria. So what we see is that state actors and non-state actors um, are using rape and sexual and gender-based violence as a tool um, in, their, uh, in, 
their, in their either terrorist activities or war-related activities. So this is definitely an issue which is increasingly on the agenda. Another pillar is the issue of participation. So what the resolution emphasizes is that increased participation of women at all levels of decision making. So this includes in national, regional, international institutions, in mechanisms that prevent, manage, and resolve conflicts, in peace negotiations, in peace operations, as soldiers, as police, as civilians, and also in the UN system as UN special representatives and heads of UN missions. So this, I would say, is, is really the, the other main pillar of the resolution, is to focus on participation. And it's quite interesting, kind of, there's a lot of debate, you know, what is the main focus of the resolution? Is it more protection or is it more participation? Um, and, you know, different, uh, in different contexts, uh, people will choose one or the other. But clearly, I mean, participation is, is very, very key. Um, to have more women working in all phases of conflict, so to prevent conflict, to resolve conflict, uh, to uh, do peace building. And this picture here, which is not that clear, is actually um, from Syrian women. So in uh, the context of the, the Syrian conflict, you have a high-level advisory group of Syrian women, including government, pro-government, pro-opposition women, that do manage to sit together and to advocate for greater participation of women uh, in the negotiations or in the resolution of the conflict. So even in extremely dangerous and active conflicts, you see women participating. So that's very much with the emphasis um, of, this, uh, of this part of the resolution. Now finally, the last uh, pillar of the resolution is peace building and recovery. So this is really in the post-conflict period. Um, and what this really uh, emphasizes is the need to build better after the conflict. So it's not to go back to the old situation where women were discriminated against, where women have to suffer injustice. The idea is that you use the post-conflict period as an opportunity to increase uh, women's participation, women equality, and, and uh, gender equality. So basically, this is to ensure that women and girls' specific needs and priorities are addressed during the relief and recovery phase after conflict. So when uh, particularly international organizations are thinking about relief and recovery, usually they think about, for example, infrastructure, building new homes, building new schools. But the thing is you need to also think about, you know, how is this going to affect women when you're rebuilding? Is it rebuilding things so you're going to benefit women or benefit men? So to do a gender analysis of the reconstruction, for example, is something that is um, recommended within this context. So it's, again, to make sure that relief and recovery doesn't only benefit the men with the guns. Because usually that's what happens, right? Usually around the negotiations table, you have men. Usually you have armed men. And usually they agree on things which are going to benefit them. Usually they agree on, for example, a disarmament programs, which are going to benefit their soldiers. They agree on asylum, which is going to benefit uh, their, their soldiers or fighters who may be even committed conflict-related sexual violence crimes. So they're thinking usually about themselves. Um, and then in the rebuilding phase, again, they're going to be thinking, ah, how can I make money on building these highways or building these buildings? But again, women are out of it. So this is why it's, it's very important to think about you know, how relief and recovery is also going to affect women and girls. Another key element, of course, is giving a role to women in politics. So in parliament, in municipal governance, and in the security sector. Um, this, this element is extremely important for us in, in post-conflict situations, but also in pre-conflict situations, or also where there is no conflict. So what we see is that the Security Council resolution is used not only in countries with conflict, but also in countries, uh, EU countries, that do not have conflict. And then one of the emphases is on this, giving a role to women in politics. So uh, it's uh, to ensure that women, again, participate and have um, a role in decision making. Um, so yes, this is, as I said at the beginning, that really you need to make sure that the peace building and recovery not only helps former combatants, but also the women and youth who have lost so much during the conflict. So. Everybody focuses on 1325, um, and 1325 is now 16 years old. 
But actually, there have been eight UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security. So 1325 is only the first one, and there have been eight other ones. Um, this poster here, which I realize you cannot see um, from where you're sitting, um, is a poster which shows the different Security Council resolutions. So you start with 1325 in 2000, um, and then the next one is 1820 in, in 2008. And basically, there are eight resolutions, and the last one was passed just last year, in 2015, and it's UN Security Council Resolution 2242. So what that shows, I think, is that you know, 1325 was a very good start, but there's a, there's a real need to continue to consider women's role in peace and security, and also to consider new issues and new threats. Now, as I said before, there's been a kind of division between those who focus on the protection side and those who focus on the participation side. In some ways, the Security Council resolutions also divide up that way. So later, during the break, um, if you have time to look at the poster, what you will see is that this group of uh, resolutions, these four ones, are really more focused on participation, more focused on women leadership. And these four resolutions are more focused on protection and the issue of conflict-related sexual violence. Um, these posters then actually get into some detail here, explaining the key elements, the key provisions of the resolutions. Um, so again, if you have time, I suggest that you look at that. And I think overall, what's very interesting with these resolutions is that they also show a kind of evolution um, of international law. So again, as I said before, now much more focus on rape as a weapon of war, on reparations for conflict-related sexual violence, on, um, on different kinds of justice mechanisms. But also, they also show an evolution of conflict. So if we thought that conflict uh, and security threats used to be mainly about war between two states, we've clearly seen an evolution. So the last Security Council resolution, the 12242, focuses very much on, uh, on what, what uh, is called their violent extremism and terrorism. So what they're thinking about is groups like ISIS, uh, like Boko Haram, uh, and so these kind of extremist uh, violent groups. And so this resolution is emphasizing what role women can play in terms of preventing the rise of violent extremism. So what that shows is that the kind of security threats that we are dealing with in the world are gradually changing. I believe that the next Security Council resolution, and this is just me guessing, what I would believe is that the next resolution would probably deal with um, disaster and climate change. Because that is now one of the big security threats that we all have. Um, you can see it with earthquakes and floods. You know, what are the roles that women can play in terms of either preventing or addressing um, disaster and climate change? So basically what these resolutions show is an evolution in the thought, thinking about security threats. The other thing that's very important about the Women, Peace and Security agenda is that it's very much focused on human security. So it's not only about the security of states, the security of big national groups, but it's very much based on the security of local communities, uh, security at the municipal level, and the threats that exist at the municipal level. So that, that's also something that the Women, Peace, and Security agenda has brought, a much bigger, broader definition of what a security threat is. Okay, um, very, very briefly, um, last year, in, uh, so after the 15th anniversary, for the 15th anniversary of 1325, um, UN Women worked with a group of experts, of uh, women uh, peace and security experts, to do a global study, which unfortunately I did not bring, but some of you may have seen. It's a very, very thick book. <laughs> basically studying how women, peace, and security have been, uh, the challenges have been addressed over the past 15 years. 
Um, I can give it to you, whoever wants the study, I can give it to you um, on a USB card uh, in the coming days. But basically what's good about the study is there's each chapter about a different issue. So about uh, security sector reform, about women in mediation, about sexual and gender-based violence. So each chapter deals with a specific topic. And just one thing I wanted to pull out of that study is the issue of funding. What that study found is that if you look at military spending in 2014, you see it's 1.7 trillion. I can't imagine what trillion really means. Um, the global cost of violence is estimated at 14.3 trillion. And then if you look at development assistance, it's 0.135 trillion. And out of that, um, peace and security assistance to fragile states which focus on gender equality, who focus on projects to assist women, is only 2% of that 0.135 trillion. So basically to say that the figures show that there's a huge investment in conflict, there's a huge investment in warfare, and there is almost nothing going to gender equality in peace building and in conflict prevention. And another uh, more specific thing is that uh, the Secretary General Ban Ki Moon regularly at the Secretary, at the um, Security Council, at the General Assembly, calls for 15% of all peace building budgets to be projects for gender equality and for women's rights. 15%. In reality, it's probably less than 2%. So, member states are very, very good at talking about gender equality. They're very good at passing UN Security Council resolutions, but in reality, it does not, so far, unfortunately, trickle down to funding. Okay, I just wanted to, just very briefly, on the national action plans, what we see, so, you have the resolutions, and some countries have decided to um, draft national action plans to implement the resolution. So these are separate things, the resolutions and national action plans. Um, so far we have 62 countries that have national action plans. 17 of uh, the EU member states have national action plans. Several regional organizations, so the European Union and NATO, have action plans. Um, so, uh, what we also see is that 29 countries of the OSCE area have a national action plan, and two of the most recent are Ukraine and Tajikistan. So, particularly Ukraine just passed their national action plan earlier this year. And what we see, the reason these national action plans are important is that, of course, they're a way of implementing these Security Council resolutions, but they're also a way of really making the Women, Peace, and Security agenda mainstream. It's making the government understand what the Peace and Security agenda is about and bringing in other parts of society, uh, understanding and then implementing the agenda. But what I want to underline here is that 29 countries of the OSCE have national action plans. Uh, sorry. 29 countries of the, uh, so the OSCE is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is the regional organization which includes EU, which includes uh, Turkey, which includes all the former Soviet space, so that includes Russia, it includes uh, the Caucasus, Central, uh, no, and not Central Asia, sorry. So it stops basically at, at Russia and, and uh, no, sorry, yes, and Central Asia. Sorry, it includes Central Asia as well. Um, so this is really, for, for Turkey, this is our region, the OSCE. And what you see is that um, 29 countries of the OSCE have national action plans. Some of those countries are in conflict, like Ukraine. Some of those countries are extremely peaceful, like Sweden and Switzerland. Um, so one thing when I, for example, go and talk to the Turkish government about uh, needing to have a national action plan, one of the things that I often hear is that, well, these national action plans are for countries that have conflicts, and us in Turkey, we don't have a conflict. Okay, first of all, that's a question. Um, but in any case, even if you were to say, it, it, you know, it, it, let's say, okay, uh, there isn't, um, that's not a proper excuse, because as I say, many EU states have national action plans, and many OSCE states have national action plans. So it's not about having a conflict. 
Now, I just wanted to point out that really uh, these are not standalone resolutions. Um, CEDAW, which is extremely applicable to Turkey, uh, has a recommendation on women, peace, and security. So it's General Recommendation 30, which says that, uh, which focuses on women in conflict prevention, conflict, and post conflict situations, uh, which calls for the end of discrimination against women in conflict, and which basically asks all signatories to report on this recommendation 30 and particularly on how they implement the UN Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security and how they implement their NAPs. So, CEDAW is very clear on the need to implement the Security Council resolutions. Just so you know, uh, this is uh, very much uh, a UN focus uh, these days, but it will become national focuses as well. It's something called the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And within the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, which all UN uh, member states have signed on to, you have uh, a goal five on women, on ending all discrimination against women and girls. And you have a goal 16 on providing for peaceful and inclusive security. So these two goals are also directly related to the Security Council resolutions. So again, this is another obligation that, um, that uh, Turkey and other member states will have to fulfill. So why should it matter specifically to Turkey? Well, Tur as you, some of you may know, Turkey actually presented at the CEDAW committee this summer. Um, and the recommendations to Turkey after the CEDAW committee review were very, very, very clear. Um, so I think it's, it's worth even reading this to you. The committee calls upon the state party, i.e. on Turkey, to establish a clear time frame to finalize and adopt the draft national action plan to implement Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security in cooperation with representatives of women's organizations and ensure that it takes into consideration the full spectrum of the Security Council's women, peace, and security agenda as reflected in all eight resolutions. So. Of course, we can have a debate about whether or not the CEDAW recommendations are actually implemented, but the point is this recommendation is now very explicit on the need to Turkey to adopt a uh, national action plan and to adopt it together with civil society. Okay. So now just, this is something we're going to discuss over the next uh, day and a half, but I just wanted to throw out some ideas on why this could be useful uh, here in the Turkish context. So, and, and this is kind of based on, on my, you know, on, on our work in the region, you know, what have national action plans helped to do in the region? Well, um, they've helped uh, have more women in politics. So they have helped ensure that you have more women in parliament, in government, and in local government. Um, they have very much helped women in police and in the army, to include, increase the number of women in police and the army, and to ensure that police and army are more sensitive to women's needs. They have helped uh, ensure more women engaged in dialogue, in mediation, and in peace efforts. So this is something for the southeast we may consider. Um, more women taking part in conflict monitoring, reporting, and early warning. Increase the protection of women who have survived conflict-related sexual violence and other forms of violence. So this could be uh, also protection for women refugees that have come to Turkey um, and who suffered conflict-related sexual violence outside of Turkey. Um, so increase the focus on the needs of refugee and displaced women and girls. and. Uh, also, a national action plan can help Turkey in its actions abroad. As we know, Turkey is also a very big country in terms of peacekeeping um, and increasingly outside in terms of foreign policy. So a national action plan can also focus on that, focus on having more women, let's say, uh, part of the Turkish peacekeeping uh, component, or even um, more women working on humanitarian uh, operations abroad. So these are some issues that I thought you know, may be useful to discuss on, on how a national action plan uh, could be useful for Turkey. Okay, I just, I have, 
two more slides. So who are our possible allies? Who are the people that we can work with on terms of defining a national action plan? Now this may not be, this is not 100% uh, relevant to Turkey, but I just wanted to show you in other countries of the region, in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Bosnia, these are some of the institutions that have been key allies, key uh, partners to civil society. So the Ministry of Defense um, is a very important partner. As I said, NATO has a 1325 action plan. So what you will generally find is that People from the Ministry of Defense that have been working in NATO, who have been working in Brussels, or working in SHAPE uh, in France, um, sorry, in, in Belgium, um, then they are generally quite familiar with 1325. So the Ministry of Defense, particularly um, the parts of it that are working with NATO. The Ministry of Interior can be a key ally, because as I said, one of the parts that's important is in increasing the number of women uh, in the police force. Um, the numbers in Turkey are unfortunately very, very low. Um, the Ministry of Family and Social Policy, uh, here in Turkey, the main government institution in charge of women's issues is the Ministry of Family and Social Policy, so that is a natural ally. It's what we call the gender machinery. Um, so in different countries, you'll have different ministries that are in charge of dealing with women's issues. Um, they're generally uh, an important partner. The Foreign Ministry, because the Foreign Ministry is the one that constantly hears from the UN, from CEDAW, from others that you need to do a 1325 National Action Plan. So the Foreign Ministry, uh, they sometimes take the lead and I can say that here in Turkey, the Foreign Ministry is very aware of, uh, of 1325 and uh, of its obligations. Um, the Prime Minister's Office, the Presidential Administration, you know, again, it, it depends in different countries, but for example, now in Georgia, uh, it's the Prime Minister's Office that is in charge of uh, implementing 1325, so it, again, you know, it depends on the context, but um, obviously if you can have the Prime Minister's office or the President's office, that's ideal. Human rights institutions like the Ombudsman office, uh, members of parliament, uh, here you have the Gender Equality Commission in Turkey, that could be potentially an ally. Um, again, parliamentarians often play a key role. We're seeing that now in Ukraine, that the women parliamentarians are playing a key role. They played a key role in Georgia, so that's uh, another potential ally. Local government authorities, mayors. Um, some, uh, when I talked about the, action, the 1325 action plans, I said it was a national action plan. But sometimes, actually the action plans become local action plans. So it's, there's nothing, you know, it's actually uh, useful to also have local level action plans. So sometimes you will find mayors uh, or municipal councils that are interested in this issue. Obviously foundations, private companies, and academics. So there's a whole range of potential allies. Um, of course, uh, you know, these may not all be appropriate for Turkey, but you know, this is something to consider where you can find allies. Obviously, the women's movement, uh, civil society, women's organizations, human rights organizations are the, the, the should be the core of, of working on a national action plan, um, but ideally together with government. So, so as I said, well, um, just this is going to be my last slide. Some of the challenges of implementing a national action plan is really thinking, you know, who is going to coordinate and lead. So as I said, in some governments, it's the Prime Minister's Office, sometimes it's the Ministry of Defense, but it's particularly, of course, challenging when you don't have government buy-in. If you don't have a key government partner, who is really going to lead this? Who is going to say, okay, that's it. It's time for us to write a national action plan. This is how we're going to do it. You know, who's going to take that responsibility? <coughs> the whole issue of inclusivity. So of having government and civil society working together. That's why I think that the CEDAW recommendation was so, so key that it emphasized that the government has to work with, with uh, civil society because it could be a tendency for the government to say, okay, we need a 1325 National Action Plan. We have enough smart people in our ministries. We will do this in a few weeks and then we will present it to civil society. So that's not supposed to be how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be an inclusive process between the government and civil society. Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to actually pay for all the projects and programs and activities that are in a national action plan? 
This is a major challenge. Um, for example, countries of the Western Balkans, many of them, Bosnia, Serbia, are now implementing their second national action plan. And for the first action plan, eh, the international community paid a lot of the money. So, you know, Sweden, uh, Norway, the UN, they gave a lot of money to implement these national action plans for the first one. But for the second one, they said, okay, now it's a government responsibility. You have to start paying for it. And that's now creating a lot of problems. So the whole issue of actually budgeting and costing a national action plan is key because it's a government responsibility at the end of the day. So it needs to be brought into the actual budget. Um, how are we going to measure success? Um, do you have data? So do you have what we call gender desegregated data? So data that shows um, the impact of projects on women and men, that shows that a project is actually supporting women and girls. Do you have that kind of information? How do you, sh how do you show that this action plan actually brings success? And then, of course, the kind of big uh, question is, uh, if you do have a conflict on your territory, if you do have war on your borders, then how do you really do a national action plan? I have to say that you know it's easy to do a national action plan, obviously, when you're sitting in Belgium um, and you're just talking about reforms within your own country, as I'm saying, including more women in police, including more women in the military. That's relatively easy. But if you actually have a conflict, how do you ensure that your national action plan is addressing conflict issues and is ensuring that women are able to participate more and that women are protected better? Um, so that's, that's really a key challenge. So I think I will leave it at that for now um, and basically be happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to go to questions. And Sabina, what I suggest is if you sit here, you can probably take one of these microphones on your lap, and then we can give this microphone to whoever wants to ask a question. It's more likely to um, let's see how many questions there are. If there are a lot of questions, what we might do is take several questions together and then let Sabina answer them you know, in a group. But we'll start with just any, any questions. And again, we'll also start with questions from the participants, and then we'll go also then to um, any of the students who want to ask questions too. So, who would like to ask a question? Yes, that's not. Türkiye'nin ilk kadın hareketi, yani 1325 sayılı bu kararı çok iyi biliyor ama Seda Komitesi ne biliyorsunuz? Fakat ben de ifade veriyorum Seda Komitesinin Türkiye'ye yönelik. E, bu e, uyarıları bir kez duyuyorum. O yüzden biraz daha ayrıntılı olabiliriz. Yani ne zaman bu karar verildi, bu konuyla ilgili e, biraz daha şey, kamuoyuyla yönelik de e, e, bilgilendirici çalışmalar olmasının önemini düşünüyorum. Çünkü Kısa Edar Komitesi'nin daha önceki e, kararları ee, bizler için çok şey ifade etmişti. Gerçekten hani özel olarak e, başörtülü kadınlarla ilgili olarak bizim için çok anlamlı e, uyarıları olmuştu, tavsiyeleri olmuştu e, Türkiye'ye. Bu yüzden bu konuyla ilgili de e, biraz daha ayrıntılı bilgi alabilirsek e, iyi olacak. Okay, let me answer that question because it's, it's very specific. Um, actually, when I was look, I was thinking of bringing to you the CEDAW um, recommendations today, and I did not do it, but um, I could bring it tomorrow if you would like. Um, the CEDAW recommendations, uh, so from this uh, summer, are, are, are very good. Um, they're, they're very good on peace and security, so actually peace and security comes up um, several times in the recommendations. Um, but they're also good on a variety uh, of women uh, rights issues. There's also um, some text on refugees. Um, so on, yes, acknowledging that Turkey has done a lot for refugees, but also underlining more things that can be done to particularly support women and girl refugees. Um, so this is a very, very, uh, I think, a comprehensive uh, list of recommendations. Now, as you say, in the past, uh, CEDAW recommendations were taken very seriously in Turkey. But this is a little bit the problem, is that, uh, you know, will they still be taken seriously, is one question. But then the other issue is that there's a, there are a lot of recommendations. 
you know, there, this is, I think, for the committee, it's a bit of a debate. Is it better to put a large number of recommendations, which are going to be difficult, of course, for a government to implement in five years, or is it better to focus on a much smaller group of recommendations where you can really measure, you know, did they meet these recommendations over the past, in the space of a few years? So that's what I would say is that the only kind of, you know, the maybe dilemma or problem with this list of recommendations is that it's very, very long. So uh, this is, you know, now the government needs to think about prioritizing the implementation. Thank you. So I see you next, and then so we'll do this one then. She could have been given the mention. Then, surely, we need a sort of max tool. Biz barıştı kadın gelişme olarak müzakere sürecinde e, parlamentoda birçok yerle görüştük. E, savaşın taraflarıyla tüm ile görüştük ama parlamentoda grubu bulunan kadınlarla da görüştük. Sizin de söylediğiniz gibi özellikle bir arkadaşımın da söylediği gibi bir 325 konusunda parlamentodaki grubu bulunan kadın ülkelerin bir kısmı tırnak içinde söyle biliyor bilmiyor gibi davrandılar ama bilemiyoruz. Sadece öyle bir tespit ama bilgi sahibi olmadıklarını gördük ve biz dersime biraz çalışıp gitmiştik <gülüyor> o şey, görüşmeye. Ee, bizden bir kısım bilgiler aldılar hazırladığımız raporlardan. Ee, sizlerin bu konuda özellikle hükümet çok önemli dediniz. Biz de buna katılıyoruz. Eğer mevcut iktidar katılmadığında barış ve müzakere süreçlerinin geldiği sonuçları biliyoruz. Onların katılımı çok önemli. Bu konuda bir çalışmanız oldu mu onlara yönelik? Ee, 1325'in Türkiye'de bilinmediği gibi mevcut iktidar ve parlamentoda kurumu bulunan yerel yöneticiler, sivil toplum bu konuda çok daha açık ve çok daha istekli ama onlar da bunu göremedik. Bir bunu sormak istemiştim. Sanıyorum siz de bizimle bir diyalog geliştirmiştiniz. Orada da öğrendim. Yani ulusal plan konusunda dan önce bence Türkiye'de gerçekten çok uzun süre bunun eğitimini verilmesi ve mesela şey tartışması çok var toplumsal cinsiyet hani kız kelimesinin kullanması kadın ve kızların kullan, kullanılması ben bir toplantıda soru sordum da neden kız diyorsunuz diye bana soru yöneltildi hani bunun bir tanımlama olduğunu yaşla ilgili bir tanımlama olduğunu söylemek zorunda kaldı İslam'da itirazlar yükseldi sizin bu konudaki fikrinizi almak istiyorum teşekkürler In terms of cooperation with the government, um, I think that it's it's you know, it's excellent that you've already been get, engaging with the government and particularly engaging with the parliament. I think that people tend to forget the parliament. Um, there's a kind of uh, tendency to go to the ministries and focus on the ministries. Um, but but as I said, I mean what I have seen in this region particularly is that the parliament can play a very very important role, and that's what we saw. Um, particularly in Georgia, where really it was the parliament that had the lead on drafting the National Action Plan and then implementing the Action Plan. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the parliament here in Turkey, I have to admit that um, we, as UN Women, do also have a program of, with, of, with the parliament, in particular with the Gender Equality Committee. Um, what was interesting is I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not leading that program. We have a, just so you know, I mean, I'm actually just as a brief introduction. I'm from our regional office. So I'm from the UN Women Office for Europe and Central Asia. So actually, uh, I have colleagues who work in Ankara um, who are the UN Women Office for Turkey. So they're the ones who are regularly implementing programs in Turkey. And one of these programs is with the Gender Equality Committee of the Parliament. Um, and uh, they are, you know, they're working on gender equality in general. Um, I have to admit, I have thought that one good option would be at one point to do a presentation on 1325 to the Gender Equality Committee. So that's not something that we have organized yet. Um, I think it's great that civil society has already reached out to the parliaments, and I think that you know this is something that I hope that also we as the UN will, will also do. Um, but I agree with you that the awareness about 1325 seems to be relatively low. So I've also met with some parliamentarians. I met with them right after they were elected, um, so uh, the end of last year. And I think we need to remember, you know, this is the problem with the parliament is that every time it's a new group of people. 
So they are just kind of learning about these issues. So we do need to increase their awareness and increase their understanding. Um, and, I, and so yes, I, I definitely agree with that point. And I think that there's an opening. I mean, the parliament is not closed to these issues. I think they're still open um, to learning. Some parliamentarians will know, but many of them won't. Um, and in terms of the, the, the government itself, so just so you, what I've seen so far in Turkey is that it's been mainly the, minist the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that's aware and interested, because as I said, they know what the CEDAW you know, recommendations are. What's also interesting is that every year at the Security Council, um, there's what's called an open day on 1325. So there's a big meeting of all uh, UN uh, member states where states make statements. So um, last year, for example, there was 110 statements. This went on for two, day, two and a half days. And there, you know, Turkey had to make a statement on 1325. So the security, so the Ministry of Foreign Affairs particularly knows that every year they're going to be asked, okay, what are you doing on 1325? So that, for me, is a clear ally. And I would say that we were kind of making progress with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs until uh, the 15th of July. Um, as you know, the 15th of July in Ankara has kind of suspended a little bit some of the more uh, analytical work uh, going on in, in the ministries. But so I hope that there'll be an opportunity to re-engage with the ministries um, you know, next year when things are hopefully a little bit uh, calmer. But so I would say that yes, the ministry, you know, particularly the foreign affairs ministry is aware. And unfortunately, we don't have, I don't have, uh, with you and women does not have direct contacts with the Ministry of Defense. But as I said, that has often been an ally. So that's also another place that we need to check with them. Birkaç bir şey ekleyeceğim. Aslında bu SEDA sürecinde Cenevre'deydim ben. Türkiye'nin Ankara'da 12 tane LGBT ve kadın örgütünden oluşan bir SEDA izleme grubu var. O bağlamda oradaydık. İHD'de oradaydı, Feray vardı. Ve biz kadın örgütleri olarak gittiğimizde ee, çok zor geçen, yani daha önce de gitmiştim, en zor geçen review'du bu. Çünkü normalde 15 arası sürüyor devletler. Ee, 6.30'da bitti Türkiye ve e, Kürt meselesi ve refüji mültecilerde tıkandı konu. Ee, hem söz, yani hem sorularında komitem sözel olarak hem de zaten e, nihai yorumlarında 12.25'i ki biz de orada NGO sunumlarımızda lunch briefing'de gerekirse de 13.25'ten sıklıkla bahsettik. Ee, tabii bu konuda çok e, hani doğrudan sorulduğunda bile sorunu yanıtsız bırakıyoruz. Özellikle bu eylem planı ile ilgili. Şimdi mesele şu, belki oradan yürüyebiliriz. Ee, özellikle parlamenterlerle görüşme konusunda ve tabii e, KSGM ve Aile Bakanlığı nezdinde. Ee, Türkiye henüz e, bu seneki review'un e, şeylerini, nihai yorumlarını Türkçe'ye çevirmedi. Ki bunu yapması gerekiyor acilinden. E, bu işte ne zaman çıktı? Epey oluyor işte Temmuz gibi. Henüz yayınlamadı. Türkçe'ye çevirmedi. Şimdi biz e, Yüven'le birlikte Ankara ofisinde Türkçe'ye onu çevirdik. Ve çok kısa bir süre halinde kısa zamanla yayınlanacak. E, dolayısıyla da çevirdikten sonra e, bir görüşmede çünkü hem giriş kısmında 13.25'ten bahsediyor hem de ee, özellikle e, mülteci ve Kürt kadınlar özelinde, kadınlar genelinde e, şiddet meselesinde, işte çatışma temelli şiddet meselesinde yine orada da bir eylem planı önerisi var. Dolayısıyla da belki bunun bir an önce Türkenle çevirmeyecekler bence. Çünkü muhtemelen en ağır, onlar için en ağır e, sonuç bildirgesi oldu Sedav'ın geçmiş yıllara kıyasladığımızda. Ancak biz çevirdikten sonra belki böyle bir görüşmeyle yeniden altına çizilip hani bu bakın burada da sıklıkla tekrarlan bir şey falan diyebiliriz gibi düşünüyorum ama bakmak lazım tabii. Karşımızda kim gideceğiz? Thank you. I saw three hands go up all together. Do you have a quick response? Yeah, I just want to say one thing. I just want to say yes. I mean, it's very very, it's very good you underline this, it's very much because of civil society, it's very much because of the women's organizations that went to Geneva that you have this recommendation. This recommendation, especially written in such a strong way, is not automatic. 
is not something that you would expect to see to all to be put in any country. We really needed to have that advocacy and that awareness building with the committee members. Mm -hmm. So this is something what I understand is that also civil society was very good at lobbying the committee members. So going directly to the committee members and explaining them the situation and why a national action plan is needed. So what I would say, what I just want to emphasize is that you've already clearly started the work and been very successful in this case. And in, in a few minutes, we're going to have an opportunity for people to say what their organizations are, are doing. So I saw your hand go up. Seta. And then it was Ushka. You, you have somebody else who has a little bit of hand. And I saw also Seta. Bilmiyorum, Ertem sorum olacak ama hani aklımdan geçtiği için şimdi paylaşayım. Belki de sonra da cevaplayabiliriz bunu diyebilirsiniz. E, Ulusal eylem planının üzerine konuşuyoruz ama şimdi ben kaçınılmaz olarak hani bu ülkede yaşayan bir kadın olarak hani, eğer ulusal eylem planına hiç yanaşmayan ve bunu hani yapmaya hevesli olmayan e, bir hükümet söz konusu olduğunda nasıl olacak? Hiç böyle örnekler var mı? E, ya da böyle bir şey çünkü bir tavsiye kararı işte Sedav'ın ki e, Birleşmiş Milletler Güvenlik Konseyi kararı ama hani bunu yapmazsa yapmayı sonsuz şekilde ötelerse bunun için herhangi bir mekanizmamız bir yaptırımımız var mı? Bir de böyle bir örnek var mı sizin hiç e, deneyimlerinizde ve çalışmalarınızda? Hani bunu hiç yapmaya yanaşmayan bir durum olduğunda biz ne, nereden başlayacağız? Ben de aslında aynı soruyu soracaktım. Ee, şeyi söyleyerek, yani sivil toplumun yaptığı, e, benim bildiğim İsrail'e Filistin var ki o da parlamentosundan geçmedi sonra ama sivil toplum e, çok büyük bir şey e, yaptı. Hani sivil toplumun yazdığı aşağıdan yukarı örneklerden biraz bahseder misiniz? Ne tür e, şeyleri oluyor? Nedir? Challenge Zorlukları oluyor ve e, nasıl üstesinden geliyorlar kısaca? Bir de hemen bununla alakalı bir şey söylemek istiyorum. Bir, bir, de, önceki yorumla ilgili. E, biz bu çalışmanın aslında ikinci bir ayağını Ankara'da yapacaktık. E, tam da bu bürokratlara bu e, bizim e, ile birlikte çalışabileceğini düşündüğümüz. Ama ne yazık ki 15 Temmuz'da yaşadık ve bürokratlar artık bu konuyla şu an ilgilenemeyeceklerini söylediler. Yani öyle bir şey aldık yoklama sonrası. Dolayısıyla böyle talihsiz zamanda başladı ama o yüzden de özellikle e, to, hükümetin olmadığı ama sivil toplumun yazdığı örnekleri e, birazcık söylemek önemli diye düşünüyorum. Um, it was actually exactly the same as uh, what Betül said because yani biz bu proje şey, yok aynı Betül'ün söylediğini tekrarlayacaktım yani biz bu projeyi aslında iki ayakta düşünmüştük bir kısmı Ankara'ya gidecektik ve bir sadeşitli komisyonunda insanlarla da görüşmeye dışişleri bakanlığında insanlarla da görüşmeyi planlıyorduk fakat böyle ön bir sorgulama sonrası e, yani hem funderlarımız açısından hem de kendimiz açısından hani bunun şu anda zamanı olmadığını öğrendik. Dolayısıyla hani bunun peşinde e, koşan sivil toplum kuruluşlarından bir de biziz. İnşallah hep beraber çalışıp bunu e, gerçekleştirmeye çalışacağız. I mean, I, I, I think we should uh, we shouldn't give up. We obviously should not give up on the government. First of all, um, yeah, the situation has been particularly bad since the 15th of July. Um, but before the 15th of July, as I've been trying to say, there was already a discussion that had started within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they were also engaging with other ministries. Um, so there is awareness within the government. Um, they they know this recommendation. They they understand what 1325 is about. So I think is that we need to kind of hope that uh, next year the situation will be a little bit different, um, because there, there there may be an interest for the government to work on this, um, because it's kind of easy. It's what we call a low hanging fruit. It's something that the government can do to kind of get uh, positive international attention. Um, you know, relatively easy. Now, the problem is, uh, one thing I did see with the government uh, earlier in the year is, as I suggested in my presentation, their tendency to keep this as a closed process. 
So what's important is that it has to be, for a successful process, it needs to be inclusive. So it's not, it's some, you know, if the government does go ahead with this next year, um, then it will be uh, up to civil society to also, you know, again, demand space um, to, to be able to work with the government um, to ensure that this doesn't just become a top-down imposed thing. Now, in terms of uh, alternatives, um, I have to say that probably some of you have better examples than I do, um, because generally what I have tended to see uh, is positive processes. So, um, as I said, you know, even in Ukraine or even in Tajikistan, um, what you've seen is that the government and civil society have worked together. Um, you know, of course, in Tajikistan, it's mainly been the government who did this, with just a couple NGOs involved. Um, but um, you know, it, it, in this region, so let's say in the OSCE region, if you've gotten a national action plan, it usually means that there's been civil society and government um, partnership. Now. What that doesn't now what what has often happened is that civil society has had to take steps before they got government engagement. So um, I think that somebody who has already done this, um, for example, is monitoring. So is preparing monitoring reports um, on peace and security, on women's peace and security that then you can present to the government to kind of say, okay, you know, don't tell us that this is not an issue in our country. It is an issue in our country, and, and, and you know, this is why. So this is one thing that civil society can do to help prepare, prepare the ground for engagement with government is reporting and monitoring on women's peace and security. Now, I have heard, but I have to admit I have not seen, um, cases of civil society doing their own action plans separate of the government. So I've heard that in certain countries, for example in Myanmar, um, their civil society did their own 1325 action plan. So that's also uh, a possibility, um, which can then, you know, kind of again put pressure on the government because it will show if civil society is working together, civil society has brought this through, civil society has clear recommendations, you know, there's no excuse for the government not to be involved. So that may be an alternative uh, as well. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, that's, that's part of the thing. We need to think about different options. So one thing I want to emphasize is that it does not need to be a national action plan. We can talk about a 1325 action plan, which can be uh, also regional. So you can also look at the OSCE, uh, sorry, at the NATO action plan, where you know Turkey is a since Turkey is a member of NATO. You can also say, well, look, Turkey inherently, Turkey has inherently uh, taken on the recommendations of the NATO action plan. So that can be one basis. You know, can be looking at the regional dimension. Um, you can look at uh, also uh, one thing that, for example, in Cyprus that we've started talking about is. Not a national action plan, because Cyprus, when you talk about national, that means two communities, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots, and that's not what we're working towards. We're working towards you know, a united island and a united solution. So there the idea would be a action plan. You wouldn't call it national, you just call it action plan. In Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is also a divided society, that's what they do. They call it an action plan. They don't call it a national action plan. So then you can also talk about local action plans. Um, you could also work with a municipality that's, that's open to these ideas and say, okay, well, we don't have a Turkey-wide action plan, but we have a Istanbul action plan, or an Ankara action plan, or a Gaziantep action plan, for example, where you have a women's mayor. Um, you know, you could also maybe think, again, of different levels of, of working on this. Thank you. I'm wondering if there are other questions that people have. And from anybody in the room? Yeah, could you say uh, a couple of questions? Uh, yeah, when you have, I'll always ask it in English, when you have a local na uh, national plan, does it have to be approved by any authority, but just the mayors can do that? Because I never heard of the local action. 
Definitely. I mean, you can have localized action plans. That's kind of the, right now, the fashion, actually, in terms of when you're peace and security, is to have localized action plans. And then it's, you know, it can be, of course, it can be up to the local mayor and the local council to pass it. They have to I mean, it depends. I mean, each government, you know, of course, it depends on the level of decentralization in the country. And in this country, you know, the mayor may feel empowered to do this and may not feel empowered to do this, for example. Um, but, you know, if it's about local governance, and if they focus on competencies which exist at the local level, then I don't see why not. I have actually more uh, concern than a uh, question or the discussion later. No, please. Okay, um, my concern is um, that the process is actually more important than uh, the outcome itself because um, like it is with the Istanbul Convention, uh, there is the danger that the government is like, um, we talked about this closed uh, process. They tend always to do like um, keeping the process to themselves and implementing like they want it and um, then reservations and not in the way we actually um, want it or need it. And uh, so I think the process itself is actually more important than uh, to really have this action plan as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, right now with the government in Turkey, <laughs> we don't even talk about it, so that will be yeah, like a difficult process, I think. I mean, I would definitely emphasize that, yes, the process is extremely important. The process is, in some ways, as important as the actual uh, outcome. But the process continues. So this is very much a kind of uh, a circular process. It's not only about drafting the action plan. It's also about implementing the action plan. And particularly, it's about monitoring the implementation of the action plan. So what you'll see in different countries is that they set up different types of monitoring mechanisms. Um, you know, sometimes those monitoring mechanisms, for example, in Serbia, are the the, the line ministries and deputy deputy deputy ministers that are sitting in that monitoring group. So, for example, in Serbia, you have the deputy minister of justice, the deputy minister of defense, etc., that are meeting regularly um, to look at the, the implementation of the national action plan. But then you'll also have civil society that's monitoring the implementation of the action plan. So sometimes you'll have it together with government, and sometimes you'll have it separate from government. But those monitoring reports are, you know, again, important way to show what's happening uh, in the fields, and then to, again, continue the process for your second action plan, your third action plan. I mean, the idea, you know, these are normally, they're two to four years long, these action plans. So again, it's part of the process which you know doesn't end with the first action plan. It continues, and the monitoring continues, and the reporting continues. So that's why um, it can be with you know government and civil society together or separate. Yeah. I'm just asking again on the as a, they don't necessarily have three questions now. We will of course have more time later on the agenda for looking at whether there are pieces that. Um, the, of the uh, Women, Peace and Security agenda that we think would be appropriately moved forward in Turkey through a national action plan. But if there's any other questions or comments, this is a great time to make them because it helps us get the discussion started. Actually, I was wondering if we could take um, a little bit of time now for, for any of you to maybe talk about what you've done already uh, on this topic. If, you, if your organization has done anything on 1325, if you could talk a little bit about it, um, that I think would be useful just to share with the group. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass the microphone around the circle and um, anybody who has something that they, that they or their organization uh, has done that relates to uh, 1325, please speak. I'll ask you to keep your comments to just a couple of minutes because we can share the time. 
uh, if there's more than some some organisations have more than one person here, and so I would ask those organisations just to have one one person speak. And if we have time, I'll pass the microphone around a second time, so anybody who didn't speak the first time can also do that. So you're asked to make any comments about what your organisation has already done, or is doing, or is planning on uh, that relates to this issue. Okay. 